Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, and I'll say it, award winning filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Aw, thank you, Josh. That's so nice to see you. I never thought I'd hear that again. Aw. <laughs> I don't think anyone doubts there'll be more awards coming to the Girl Who Wore Freedom and Christian Taylor and other people involved mm -hmm. in the production. But also with us is, as always, our trusty dusty research extraordinaire, button pushing guy. Couldn't do it without him. Also on the Movie Proposal podcast, Jason Rugg. Hey there. And an award winning yeah. producer. Oh, right. <laughs> Uh, I think we covered that last time. Is that we right? Did. We did. Yeah. Hey, before we jump in, um, you know, this podcast is about, you know, making The Girl Who Wore Freedom, a World War II documentary. I just want to promote, by the time this podcast you're listening to now, um, the movie proposal podcast will have released our, our podcast where we feature uh, Tom Hanks' Greyhound, the World War II film about crossing the Atlantic. And so if you like that sort of thing, check out Movie Proposal Podcast, Greyhound, starring Tom Hanks. Yeah, it's a great podcast, everybody. I encourage you to listen to it. Of course, the film is, I'm a little mixed about. I think it's a great film, but uh, I think, Josh, you'll review it much better than I on the Movie Proposal Podcast. Oh, well, be sure to check it out then. So now today we're talking about our first time filmmaker, Christian, and your film, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. So we need, uh, well, first I want to say we have a special surprise guest, which we will get to in a minute. I know, I'm so, so excited about that. Very excited. Uh, but before we do that, let's get an update on the film. Yeah, so just real quick, it's been a super exciting week. Um, if you are listening to this podcast, uh, you're going to hear some uh, news, breaking news, actually. We just found out that we have indeed been selected for in-person screening for the Chagrin Documentary Film Festival. So uh, that is just super exciting. I can't even say how excited I am about that. That's going to be October 10th at 4.30 p.m. on a Saturday in Chagrin Falls, Ohio at a drive-in movie theater. So, Oh, uh, that's very the, cool. Yeah, the whole social distancing thing. And it's tentatively scheduled for, um, for them. We shall know soon when it's, you know, when it'll be locked in. But, uh, and the other thing is, it is going to be geoblocked, so it will be streamed online as well, but only in Ohio. So, if you're in Ohio, I would suggest plan to drive to the drive in movie theater and meet us in person, socially distanced, of course. Um, but also, if you live in Ohio, you can stream online. So, that was exciting. Um, and well, then, so hold on, yeah, uh, real quick, you've seen your film on a movie screen, on a TV on an iPhone, on a computer screen. Have you seen it in a drive-in movie theater yet? Truth be told, I've never, ever even been to a drive-in movie theater. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Your film is going to be the first film you see in a drive-in movie. Wow. Isn't that's, that crazy? Uh, crazy. That's crazy. incredible. <laughs> I know. So excited about that. Uh, yeah. And I even talked to CEO Bauer and his niece, and they may end up coming. So it's oh, wow. going to be a really exciting experience. Um, the other news we got this week was that we have been accepted to the Lady Filmmakers Festival in Beverly Hills, California. So Ooh. that is very exciting. It's one of the top 10 female filmmaker focused uh, film festivals in the world. So we will have more news about that uh, coming up. And then we continued our distribution discussions this week. Um, those are still moving along. We have interesting stuff to report about that. And we'll have David back on to talk about that uh, at another time. I do not want to waste any more time. I want to get to our surprise guest. I'm so excited to, um, to bring her on. So jo Josh, tell us who we have today. Okay, today, drum roll please. We have first time filmmaker, Executive producer of Big Teeth Productions. Give it up for Elise Jaffe. Woo! Woo Hi. Elise. Hello, Hi, guys. Elise. Welcome I'm to the podcast. I'm so excited to be here because I feel like I know you so well, but you've never seen me. Well, Christian has. So, Josh and Jason, it's so nice to be part of this today. We're glad you're here. So, you are a voiceover talent. You are a producer. Apparently, you're an agent as well. Is that right? <laughs> 
I'm not an agent, but I sort of actually, I was recently for my husband who's a director and I had to be his agent, but my agents are the first thing that pop up on my LinkedIn, but it's sort of my last job that I do. So, you know, well, she is a successful VO agent, uh, or <laughs> VO talent who has an agent is what I meant to say. So yeah, and I'm also really excited to hear about the Chagrin Film Festival because I am from Cleveland, Ohio. And Chagrin Falls is a suburb of Cleveland. And it is where it's like the very cute neighborhood where you go to see a little bit of nature. And there was a little custard shop there, which you'll have to go to when you're there. Um, it's just one of my favorite parts when I go home to take my kids now. And so that's, I'm so excited for you. How crazy is it that you are from there? That's what a wonderful day for you to be on our show. I think that you should come and join us uh, at the drive-in movie theater. I mean, I don't have to be here for my kids to be in school these days, so I can travel whenever I want, as long as they have a computer to learn on. That's right. Well, awesome. Hopefully we can make that happen. Well, we are, we have you here today. It's just so incredible um, how this all happened, especially because Elise and I met about 10 years ago at the Midwest Independent Film Festival. I was a brand new talent, a uh, voiceover talent with a little sh shiny new demo. And I went to the film festival and I saw Big Teeth Productions had a booth and I thought, mm, I wonder if they have any voiceover jobs. And so I went to give them my uh, card and tell them I did voiceovers. And the guy says, yeah, well, my wife does all of our voiceovers. <laughs> and then I never heard from them again. So uh, <laughs> we're awful. No, you know, you, you <laughs> fulfilled all of your needs. But what's so interesting is you just never know when things are going to pop back up. And so about two weeks ago, Sandy Gordon, who is a consultant on our film, reached out to me and said, hey, I have a friend you might be hearing from. And uh, that started this journey with Elise. So Elise, why don't you tell us the rest? So the reason I had reached out to Sandy was because I'm starting, well, I guess a few months ago, I started the process of my first feature documentary. Um, it's been an idea I've had. I've always been interested in documentaries. In fact, like maybe 14 years ago, maybe a little less than that, I went to at um, Columbia College, they had a Documania conference, which was like all documentary all the time. My husband and I who work together and own our company together, he had started working on potentially doing a documentary about um, bourbon in the United States. And he's like, well, you're gonna produce it. So you should go learn about documentaries. So I went and I, I really loved it. It's actually was the first, I, you guys in one of your episodes had talked about your favorite documentaries. And at that conference, I saw they screened for us IO USA, which was a documentary that put this idea in my head of like, you're going to make a film like this one day using graphic, like the graphical element made a topic that normally the national debt, which was not that interesting to me, although I should have thought it was, um, it made it interesting. So I learned that there and I'm like, but one day I really am going to do my own film. And I've been producing for 22 years, but I've been doing mostly commercial and sales pieces. And my business is going to be 15 years old this September, next month, 15 years old. And we do a lot of documentary style work. And one of my favorite things to do is interview real people. Um, I, last week I was talking to surgeons from University of Illinois at Chicago about a new lab they're opening and it's fascinating to me, but about a year and a half ago, I was hired to direct, not just produce. Actually, I had to give someone else the producing job so I could focus on directing. Um, and I beat out six other, five other directors for a, um, a job about a woman or a tattoo artist who was designing a hair straightener for like the design that would be on a hair straightener for a company called GHD in London. And he's a tattoo artist who specifically tattoos women who have mastectomies and have survived breast cancer. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen any of this art, but it's like amazing ornate work um, that make people feel really good about their bodies after having lost something really important to them. And GHD was giving a chunk of money from each of the sale of these products to breast cancer research. And the woman being tattooed, she was not the focus of the film or of the documentary short that we were doing. 
she and I became friendly because we had spent time together before her tattoo. I sat with her while she was being tattooed. And it so happened that she was Jewish and I am Jewish. And we are taught when we are Jewish that you do not get tattoos. Tattoos are totally taboo. The Torah tells you not to do it. Um, and I was very interested in knowing why she was doing that. So that's, that sparked my interest. And a year and a half later or so, I said, I'm going to make a film that's about Jews and tattoos. And as Christian will tell you, stories end up changing as she's talked about her script changing. We're lucky that in the time of COVID, we have been able to meet and talk to so many people that are willing to give me their time to be pre-interviewed so I can figure out a lot of my story now versus shooting it and having hundreds of hours that no one ever touches. I'm sure I'll still have like a lot of hours that aren't, but um, I'm trying to figure out my focus now before we go into shooting. And it has completely changed from when we started talking to people four months ago. So now my film is about reclaiming your body after trauma or illness that has left you scarred physically and how tattoo, getting a tattoo over that scar has changed your trajectory forward in life. So that was a long answer, but I know that a couple of weeks ago, Flo was on and his answers were very long. So I think that wasn't <laughs> quite as long as his though. So. Yes, we uh, have gotten used to long answers. So you are in good company. So, so I you, say you, my it sounds like you're in, up, it's, it sounds like you're in pre-production. Is that, is that right, Elise? Yeah. So I'm calling this like an attorney would call um, discovery. Um, I am typically given the topic that I'm doing my work on and I'm given like an article about each person I'm interviewing and I create questions for them. But this is like starting from scratch. Right now we're in the process of finding the people. So Molly, who is our main talent and her tattoo artist, David Allen, if anybody um, has ever heard of him, he's, he's very famous for doing this work. He's actually had an exhibit in the Chicago Surgery Museum, which is a thing. Um, and they are my two main story, but I want there to be five to six stories that we're focusing on that are all going to tie together. And I don't want this just to be about breast cancer. I don't want this just to be um, women. I am looking at stories that have all different types of scarring. Um, so if anyone's listening to this podcast and has either, either is a tattoo artist or knows someone who has been tattooed over a scar, please reach out. We've talked to a lot of people with varied stories and I'm it's, it's emotionally draining to talk to them and hear about their story, but I think they're very excited about the chance of their story being told in order to inspire other people who might be feeling self-conscious, knowing that this could be an option, but also knowing that whatever taboos are, or biases their family members or their um, community or religious community has, Perhaps this, their story could inspire those people to think differently about it. Modernity, you know, throughout our times, things have been interpreted so many different ways. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in finding out if people's views change based on who the person is who's going through it. So yeah, we're just finding our stories now and going through some of the legal stuff that Christian um, helped me realize I needed to do as soon as, before I got started. So I have no title oh, to you now because we have no title yet. There, there's a whole book that can be written on the things Christian has learned yeah. about what to not do <laughs> or should have done. And so it's good that you've learned those things. Um, so one thing that Christian has talked about, especially working with Bill Ebel, is finding like the crux of the story. Because, you know, when I... I did a year of film school and my first film, I, I, I decided to make a documentary because I thought it would be easier than telling a narrative story. Cause a documentary is just supposed to like, here's the story. You just tell it one, two, three, four, five, six in order, but that's not how it works. You have to find the story and the trail you're going to tell. So how is that? Pro Cause and you even alluded to it earlier, you had something in mind and then it morphed into something else. So can you talk about what you've learned in that process of finding the story in this documentary? Absolutely. So when I wanted this to be about Jews and tattoos, first I searched that and found that. Title, by the, by the way, I love well, that. I, yeah, and it's funny because we thought about that being the title, but, I, but somebody had started a documentary 15 years ago with that title. 
Um, and But they never got it made. So that was one of those days where I was like, nope, can't do it anymore. I'm throwing in the towel. Someone's doing this. Um, but then I realized that that shouldn't stop me and I'll have a different spin on it. Um, I do like that rhyming thing though. Um, but I realized that as a director, and my, I have, this is not my first time directing. I've directed short films and I've directed some of these pieces that we do internally um, for, for clients. Um, but one of the things I really like to do as a director is talk to real people about their emotional stories and their paths. What I don't particularly like this sounds awful, but is historical pieces. I like to watch them, but I am not a history person. This is crazy. I know, which is crazy because I loved Christian's film. And that is how I learned so much of my history <laughs> is by watching documentaries. I'm just not going to make that documentary because that's not my husband is also a director and he was a history minor in college. And that's the stuff that he loves. So he actually got mad when I turned Beard away. I should also add that my husband is an editor. So he's gonna be editing this piece. So I do need him to be invested in it, but it's my film, it's not. That we've had those conversations. This is my film, this is what I wanna do. I don't wanna, I don't wanna do a philosophical story about all of these different rabbis' perspectives and religious people's perspectives and, um, that, that's not what I wanted to do. I, I didn't want to tell a religious or historical story, um, which also saves me from having to find archival, lots of archival footage and worrying about licensing it. Um, but so when I got to that point and said, I want to tell these stories, that's when it became more about all the different types of experiences and types of people that this could help and inspire. And from talking to the religious people about it, I realized that this is not a Jewish subject. It is it, many forms of Christianity also felt the same way. Uh, Islam feels the same way. And so it became a bigger, bigger picture item. So now it's more the biases that come into it. I mean, you also have the biases of tattoo of like people are thugs, people are criminals. This is dirty, all of those things. So they're all, of, oops, sorry, I keep bumping my table. All of these things, um, I mean, I felt this way too. I have a totally different perspective about tattoos. I should also add, I do not have any tattoos. Um, I do have scars on my body. And doing this project was the first time I ever thought, oh, well, maybe that would be something that I would do. So everybody I talk to asks me if I'm going to end up getting a tattoo at the end. So that'll be interesting. But, um, but yeah, so the story changed from that. Now, funny enough, a lot of the people that I'm talking to happen to be Jewish or there's somebody Jewish in their life. So they bring that up without me even bringing it up. Um, but it's going to be, the story's going to change when I lock in who those people are because I'm going to have to figure out how they connect. And I don't want to do too much. Uh, I just watched a film recently called Far From the Tree. And it was about people who were born... Uh, they felt a little different than their families. They were like an odd man out in their family, whether they had a physical disability or an emotional disability or, um, and, or they were adopted and how they fit into those lives. But what they did was they took these, like, I think it was five stories and they weaved them together and watching that made me go, this is what, this is how I want to do it. And that's what happens every time. That's why I watch at least three documentaries a week because I want to learn from them and figure out what's gonna be best for mine while doing it in my own way. I'm sorry, Josh, again, long answer. Did I answer your question? <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, yes, go ahead. Christian, you had a question. Well, I was gonna say, um, again, it's a very similar journey to mine where you do start off with an idea, you think it's gonna be one way, you get into it and you know all the facts change and it'll change even further based, based on access you get or just different things along the way. Uh, and it, ultimately I found, I did the same thing. I watched so many documentaries thinking that it was gonna be one way and then I hit onto one uh, if you've never listened to the podcast before, it was Generation Wealth. And it was the first time that I watched a documentary where a female told her personal journey of discovery, wrote it herself and narrated it. And it gave me a vision for what people told me my story should be that I had fought for such a long time because I heard Ken Burns and Peter Coyote in my head. Um, and so, you know, I hear Elise um, talking and I think she will have to cross 
cross that bridge at some point, you know, is this a personal journey of discovery where in the end she does get a tattoo? Um, she's not there yet, but we had the same issue where we had all of these stories, this big basket of fascinating stories and to try to figure out how to weave them together took time. And I do think that it is wonderful you are so far ahead of the game from where I was. I mean, you've produced much more than I ever produced. You've been in this industry. You have an editor that you're married to. So that's a built-in cost I didn't have. Um, and you, <laughs> um, I still you know, do have to pay him. I do have to pay him. Oh, well, okay. Do you, do you really? Do you, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I have a budget. But that's, the, that's the other thing I go into this as, as a producer. Like, I have a very detailed budget. Um, and it includes all the post-production because he still works for, I'm going to have to pay my company for all the weeks that work. I want to prioritize this. So, I mean, he'll do it in his free time if we don't raise the money because I'm going to force him to, but I also need him to help with my children. I'm not going to be like, go, you go edit for the next three weeks. I'll handle them. Um, so he's going to have to, there's going to have to be compensation on that. And I have an amazing animator who's going to do the graphics for this, which to me is a huge part of it. And she's going to be pay like everyone that works for me is I'm paying them anyway. So I've got to pay them, but it, it is certainly a little bit easier because I can, well, you just have so much more experience. You have so much more experience than I have in general. And, and now you've listened to all my mistakes. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you won't make the same ones, uh, which brings me to my next question, which is, you know, it is interesting to me that you have found this podcast fascinating, given the fact that you do have so much experience. I mean, I'm incredibly humbled because I'm thinking, what in the world could I possibly offer you? I... um. It's funny because at first when I started listening, I was like, oh, well, maybe if there's one that I feel like I know some of this, I'll just skip it. And then every time, well, first of all, I wanted to hear the updates on everything that was going on with you, even though I knew a lot of the updates since I started listening to podcasts from over a year ago and I'd already talked to you. But um, and I ended up not really skipping very many because there was something in each one that I wouldn't have thought about. The main things that I was learning I mean, I know about the paperwork and the rights and clearances and stuff in terms of everything I'm using. I didn't know about the book that I have to have for a distributor. I knew going into this that I knew nothing about distribution. And that was one of the things that I also just, I should also give a shout out to our assistant here, um, Cecilia, who has pretty much kept me going on the path the entire time. And she has also been listening to the podcast. So um, she's been incredibly helpful, but I wanted her to listen to everything too. So we could discuss it and she could say to me, Oh, did you know this? And I'd say, no, in fact, I didn't. Now let's go learn more about how that's going to impact us. So I did have like a partner in crime to like book club it with, I guess podcast club it with, <laughs> um, but all the distribution stuff uh, I knew on a like higher level what was involved, but not the intricacies of it. So all of that has been incredibly interesting to me. Um, the other thing uh, that was, it just was nice to hear other people's suggestions for films to listen to and just, just the fundraising part of it too. The fundraising and the distribution stuff I think is probably the biggest most important, most impactful stuff to me on everything I listened to because I want to do it like you and I don't want investors and um, I, I just have to figure out how the best way to go about it is. And uh, I'm not sure if I'll do as many screenings as you have done before COVID hit. And I wasn't thinking about the film festival circuit, even though I know that it's part of it and I've been to a few film festivals, but now I know a lot more details about how you as a filmmaker approach all of it. So, I mean, there was something in every episode that was really Well, helpful. that's super encouraging. I have always sort of uh, felt like um, my role is a trail guide. Even in the voiceover world, I would end up coaching because I would make so many mistakes. I would just 
dart out of the gate, make all the mistakes. And then I'd want to be like, oh, I don't want anyone else to make all these mistakes. I better like give my cautionary tale. So, I mean, it does mean a lot that it has been helpful. I think what I'm hearing though, I think it's going to be fascinating. And I think we should continue to check back in with you because your film is so different. Your experience is going to be different. You were going to stumble upon things and issues that I didn't and that you're going to have to learn that are be, going to be completely new. So I do think we, uh, we can kind of now follow you on your journey um, as you, you know, discover new things or make mistakes. I think one thing you told me that we talked about early on um, is the title search and figuring out a good title that you can stick with early on and that, and as well as making sure all your life rights were locked up and all of your paperwork was in order in the beginning. If I could save anybody a headache that I'm going through now, that would be it. And you were like, oh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. And my intention with the two other people that are my co-executive producers that aren't giving money, they're just giving their time, they're consulting, they're, um, they're going to be on camera for me. Uh, it was always my intention before I even did our pitch deck to have some kind of contract with them. But this is such a different situation than, I have so many contracts on my Google Drive of different templates that I've used for business. They're not an uh, independent contractor. They're not a client. Uh, they're not a talent. They're, it's so specific um, that I've been trying to get a really good template because my attorney also is like, they have a department that's for entertainment, but he doesn't focus on entertainment. And it's going to take a lot longer to get answers from the entertainment team. So he's like, if you get me a template, I can help you write it. I, I'm used to doing this, Tim. I give him a list of bullet points that need to be in there. I give him some template that it's similar to what we're trying to do and he'll help me write it. But I haven't gotten the right template. Like everything I look at, it's different for every person. And I'm also part of a group um, called the D word. Have you guys heard of the D word? So the D word is an online um, social network of documentary filmmakers. And when I, one of my professors from college, which is behind me, Indiana University behind me, um, he's a documentary filmmaker. And when I was starting this, I immediately reached out to him and I was like, will you just talk to me about your process? He's retired now from teaching, but he's still making films. He told me about it. And um, I went on, I immediately signed up for, a, you know, an account, um, did a small profile, but they, because of COVID, were doing these Friday networking things. So it was a group of like 50 people. You're all on at the beginning. The people who run it talk about a few things and then they break you up into, you know, breakout groups and some are fundraising, some are distribution. It's, it's really a really good resource for new filmmakers and even experienced filmmakers um because those are the people that are answering the new filmmakers questions so um i did meet a handful of people from that that i've been communicating with and have asked them do you have a template and they're like most people are saying oh no you just have to write one up and i'm like no just give me if you're okay just share one i'm not going to copy yours so i've got three that now are all a little different um but i would again i would suggest that uh, the D word, it's D dash word, I think is the website. So, um, super helpful. Uh, but that, and then the titles, and that's going to cost money, obviously. Um, and then the title search, I did not realize how expensive that was. And I have like five different potential titles. So now I have to decide on one that I really want to do a search on. And I'll do preliminary searches because I thought of a new title yesterday that I was really excited about. And then I searched it and there's a book by that title. So then I'm like, well, can I make it a plural? But I'm not gonna spend the money on the title search with the attorney if I already know. So My Body, My Canvas, which was our original title, is already being used as a hashtag. But it's not as we can find on a basic title search, like our own personal internet search, there's nothing that's copyrighted to it. But it's a hashtag, which could help us. Um, but is it the right connection? So. That's those two things are my new legal next steps, which is why I'm hoping I can do a um, an email out to all of the people we've already done Zooms with, tattoo artists, some of these other documentary filmmakers, a few other people that I can give them an update of what's going on, ask them if they will be on my mailing list for when I actually start a mailing list. 
and say, we're trying to raise right now between five and $10,000 just to do this prep. I originally budgeted 20,000 for pre-production. If I can get five or 10, I can get some of these things done. So, well, I would say, you know, the reason I really emphasize that she work on that now is I was very fortunate. A, I had uh, someone volunteer, a lawyer volunteer to do the title search for us. And my title was free and clear. But we did not do that until the very end. And we were just unfortunately blessed for those reasons. But like she said, if you go through this whole process, you do all of this branding and then for the rights Bible, you go to have your talent search done, title search done and it's taken. Oh, it's just devastating. So, um, you know, if you are a first time filmmaker listening to this, um, you know, again, we really stress the importance of doing that title search early on. Well, and then you can get your website. I've, I'm going to probably buy like five URLs anyway, because then I, at least I've got all of those options, but I want to build our website. I want to start a Facebook group. I think our main source of social is going to be Instagram because visually there's going to be so much that I think people will gravitate towards. Um, but I want to be able to start all those things and I want them to be with the actual title. So um, hopefully that will happen soon. I mean, for now, I'm just going to, anything that we're doing that we are trying to share or post on, will probably just be on the Big Teeth site or on the Big Teeth Facebook page or Instagram. So at least people who are like, if someone's hearing this and they're like, well, how am I going to know whatever happens with this? Well, you can follow up with Christian or you can look on the Big Teeth um, yeah, so why don't you give us that URL? Um, so Big Teeth is www.bigteeth, big teeth. It's because I have big front teeth, if anyone wants to know. Um, it's nice to be able to do this on Zoom. Bigteeth.tv. Yeah, so that's how you would find Elise and her company. Um, and then I wondered, you guys, um, if you have any questions for Elise. Uh, yes, I do. So... Um, Elise, if I'm mean, just this is just a hypothetical, you do decide to get a tattoo, what are you going to get? Okay, so the reason I don't have a tattoo now is because there has not been anything that I've really thought is the right thing to get. So if I get one, I don't know. I think it'll be like it'll hit me. Molly, who's my main talent for this, she said that she and I should get matching tattoos when it's over. So maybe it's going to be something that has to rep that represents the film. I don't know. Um, I'm definitely not going to get like someone's name. <laughs> um, I've heard <laughs> way too many stories throughout this process of people getting tattoos that have to get covered up. Um, not that not that anybody important in my life isn't going to be there at some point, but. Uh, no, I mean you could get the title of your film. If this ends up getting made and you get distribution, you know, yeah. That, yeah. That. but also I thought it was such, such a funny thing. She was listening to the podcast the other day and she texted me, Oh my gosh, you're talking about tattoos. And I was like, <laughs> we're talking about tattoos. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I had no recollection of that. You talked about the addiction of tattoos. Like once you get one, isn't that, you said like, isn't that the thing? I don't, can't remember what you're referencing, but you're like, isn't that what happens with tattoos? Once you get one, then you just can't stop. <laughs> um, I don't know. I have a, like a very low pain threshold. It's very interesting. I mean, I've had two children, but um, if I get a cut on my finger, I'm like in excruciating pain for days. So the idea of that is, and I mean, I sat there while Molly was being tattooed. I held her hand and she got like a massive tattoos across her chest. And, and I was like, hoo, hoo, and she was fine. So I might not be the right person for it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know what it'll be. Fascinating. We will certainly have to follow your journey. That is for sure. <laughs> Oh, the other thing you mentioned, by the way, I should note is that you guys had two different episodes. You talked about SCAD. Yes. And my animator who works for me uh, went to SCAD. She's not like super like scatty based on what you <laughs> said that was. But, um, she's incredibly, incredibly talented. She's such an incredible designer. And I'm very lucky because she helped us build just a look and a feel for what the film is going to be um, as well as very detailed description of what the graphics are going to be. Um, I, I should also add that a lot of the work that I produce is animation. My company does half live action, half animation. And I focus a lot more on the animation when I'm not doing documentary style work. I don't do as much 
scripted work. Um, and I love doing animation. So to me, that was such a really, like a good way to enhance the film, especially when we're talking about art. I do want it to be kind of like an art film. But anyway, it was just funny that you guys mentioned SCAD. Well, so for those of you who don't know what SCAD is, that's Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia. And we were talking about that because David Patterson is on the board of the Savannah Film Festival, which is now partnered with SCAD. So we still have to hear back from SCAD as to whether or not we get in their film festival. We're pulling for that. Yes, Josh? They also, they also rejected me from uh, film school. Oh, right. Sorry. Oh, I'm that. sorry to have brought that up. <laughs> you just ripped it's that right. band-aid off the old scab it, it, it all worked out it all worked out <laughs> well at least thank you so much i really uh it's wonderful to meet you i can't wait to follow your journey now and see where it leads you and uh it's going to be super exciting and you know while we're here if anybody is listening to this podcast that is a first time filmmaker we'd like to hear about your journey too so why don't you email me at christian at normandystories.com it would be uh, really cool to find out if uh, our podcast has helped you as well we could have you on just like Elise and follow your journey so yeah email me at christian at normandystories.com also I wanted to throw this out there if you're listening and you care about our podcast uh, we are in dialogue Dire straits financially. Um, over the last month, we've had $300 donated. Um, and that is way far short of our monthly expenses for Normandy Project. Um, we have so many monthly expenses and overhead, such as, you know, different uh, subscription services to edit our things and people that I still owe back pay to for um, lots of stuff on the film. So if you are able to help us in any way, you can make a donation at thegirlwhowarefreedom.com slash donate. If you can't remember that, just go to our website, thegirlwhowarefreedom.com. You can also purchase anything in the shop that does help offset uh, costs for us. And um, yeah, we would just really appreciate it. The film festival run is exciting, but it too has inherent costs as well as the distribution deliverables. Elise, let me just tell you this right now. I don't know if your budget for distribution costs are in there, but I was shocked by how much it's going to cost us to put together everything we have to put together to give to our distributor. And um, I'm going to have to pay my editor to do work. So it was far more than I budgeted for, I got to tell you. Yeah. When you mentioned that in one of the episodes, I was already like, I got to prepare for that. Yeah. But I don't want to adjust my, my, bottom line number or top line. I don't want to adjust the number now. So I have to figure out what I would take from, which likely will just be Craig's editing fees. Well, uh, <laughs> you and I can have to do more work and get paid less. <laughs> you and I can talk about that later and I'll give you some suggestions. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. It was great so to much for having me and I'm excited to keep following your journey. Thanks. Hey, Jason, you've been awfully silent this time. Do you have any questions, anything else to add? Uh, nothing specific. No, I'm, I'm looking into your website. I probably, it, next time we have you back, I think I'm going to have some questions, but uh -oh. yeah, okay. I'm excited. I'll be right. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, th Elise, thank you very much. And I uh, also want to thank everyone for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. You sure can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>